Welcome back, everybody. Our next uh, speakers are here from CodeThink, uh, giving us a talk on OpenQA. They've updated their talk in the last few months, so if you saw the one in Berlin, it's going to be there's something, some new content. Uh, Lawrence, and I can't pronounce your last name. Don't worry, neither okay. can I. And uh, James Thomas are your, are your presenters, so please welcome them. Thank you very much, Walt, for the introduction. Yeah, so um, the title of the talk is OpenQA Testing on Hardware Automated Full System Tests. Actually, OpenQA is one of the main tools that we've used uh, in this kind of journey that we've been on over the last few years when we're thinking about functional testing on, on hardware and automating that. But actually, in addition to that, there's quite a few other tools that we've created uh, that we're also going to be talking about today. So. Um, yeah, by way of introductions, uh, Walt just did a great job of that already, really, but um, my name is Lawrence, a project manager at CodeThink, James is a senior engineer at CodeThink, and we've been working on automotive projects for many years now, and we're also both involved in free and open source software as well. And I'll talk a little bit more about uh, what CodeThink is and what CodeThink does in a couple of slides. But yeah, today's talk is going to be really talking through, um, like I say, this, this journey that we've been on, um, thinking about automated testing, uh, functional testing on hardware. So I'll start with a bit of context around why we think testing is so important and trying to set the scene. And then I'll do a, a little recap on what we've talked about before. And then we're gonna, I'll hand over to James and we'll talk about some, some new advancements that we've made, some new developments in testing and automation. So why testing matters in automotive? So actually, even before we start talking about testing, I think um, it's useful to set the scene and, and talk about software complexity in the vehicle. And probably I don't really need to labor this point because I think everyone in the audience will be aware of this kind of um, overarching challenge that we're facing at the moment as an industry. Um, I think I read, I read in an article a few weeks ago lines of code in a vehicle 10 or 15 years ago was about 10,000 lines of code on average. And now today, if you look at AGL, the IVI, plus the cluster, it's just shy of 200 million lines of code. And I can't find that article anywhere. So if anyone does find, if anyone sees that, please link it to me. I can't, I can't find it. But I de definitely did read that. Um, and, you know, as an industry, I think that's just indicative of the challenge that's being faced. And this article by McKinsey, uh, I won't read through all of this, but it summarizes it quite nicely. The level of uh, complexity of the features that consumers are demanding, the difficulties uh, posed by integration of those features, and um, especially software updates over the air, it points that out specifically. Essentially, the automotive industry is kind of struggling to keep pace. The productivity is not quite matching the complexity that we're seeing. Uh, and I've put this um, comment on the bottom here, which is about most automakers are not really set up to support software for the life cycle of the vehicle. Uh, I just bought a car in December, and I'm pretty sure I won't get any software updates, although it's going to be on the road for 10, 15, maybe 20 years. It's a pretty basic car. Maybe a, a better car might get more software updates. And I know that you know, this situation is changing. People are working on this and trying to do, um, you know, full system updates more regularly and, and easier. But um, generally speaking, I, I think most, most products out there, not just vehicles, but most products are not really designed to be maintained for the life cycle of the whole product. Okay, so CodeThink in our view. So CodeThink is a software services company and what that means is that we work on lots of different automotive projects. So we have quite an interesting vantage point, I think. We work with lots of different tier ones and lots of different OEMs as well. And invariably, we, we see the same kind of things happening on projects, which has led us into thinking about testing. Um, we're an open source consultancy with a strong expertise in embedded Linux. And <clears throat> excuse me. also, we spent a lot we have spent a lot of time thinking about the integration story and the construction of software so you know the software delivery life cycle as it's called build test deploy integration that's kind of you know an area where we've been really focused on <clears throat> 
So the theory of constraints, I wanted to add a slide about this because I think it's a very useful frame of reference to think about problems on, on projects and, and generally, uh, you know, in software delivery as on an ongoing basis. So I first learned about this from a book called The Phoenix Project, which is it's kind of about uh, DevOps and, and IT services and how this the theory of constraints originally comes from a production line manufacturing process, but how that can be applied to uh, DevOps and IT. And it's uh, it's a novel actually. It's 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 a really really good book. I, I recommend it to anyone who, if you haven't read it, the Phoenix Project is really good. Uh, but the theory of constraints is is useful because it's kind of founded on this principle of bottlenecks in the system. So, in a rough summary, the maximum throughput of your system is constrained by the maximum throughput of your your bottleneck. So if you can alleviate the bottleneck, the overall capacity of your system will be alleviated in line with that. So an improvement of the bottleneck is an improvement for the whole system. If we think about this example of a, a highway with six lanes for all the different vehicles, and then there's a crash in the middle or there's something that's happened, you can see that you know, the, the maximum throughput is only um, as, as wide as the, the bottleneck is. So, yeah, improvements to the bottleneck are improvements to the whole system. And then conversely, any effort that you put in either side of the bottleneck is not really having any impact. It's, it's, it's an illusion. It's a complete waste of energy. So when code thing comes onto projects and if things are delayed or something like that, and, we, we often try to look for the actual bottlenecks and see where they are. <clears throat> so yes, uh, what that usually means, I mentioned earlier, we see the same patterns repeating. Almost always, we start to think about testing. And usually that's trying to make testing more reliable, more repeatable, uh, more robust. Almost always, we're pushing for automated testing in CI pipelines, but also we try to bring testing as early in the development cycle as we possibly can, what people call uh, shift left, because the earlier that you find an issue, the less expensive it is to fix. And I don't just mean in terms of uh, dollar signs, but in you know in people, people's time and, and all the other resources that go into projects. So why is it more, why is it less expensive to fix an issue the earlier you find it? Well, <clears throat> testing is generally an expensive part of a project. Overall, we, we still believe that testing is generally overlooked on a lot of projects. Um, a lot of projects rely solely on manual testing. Uh, and on large automotive projects, you can be looking at hundreds of people. Sometimes in the biggest projects, you know, it can be into a thousand people who are validating the, the vehicle at any one time. Um, and hardware is quite a prized resource, especially in the early days of a project. You know, people can kind of not literally fight over it, but uh, certainly, you know, it, it, you know it, it's difficult to get your allocated time with the hardware in the early days of the projects in our experience. So if you have, um, a, 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 for example, if you have a really critical issue on the software that it doesn't boot or something like that, you really want to find that in emulation before you put it onto the hardware. Because if you know that you have a really critical issue, you don't need to waste that valuable resource. You don't need to waste people's time putting it onto the hardware. And then if we extend that one step further, the vehicle environment is the most expensive testing environment on a project. You know, it takes a long time to get the, the, the vehicles wired up into a prototype state. You have to have a special license to operate them and all this kind of thing. So um, any issue that you find in the vehicle environment that you could have found earlier is again, it's, it's, a, it's wasting people's time basically. And in, a, in an extreme example on the pro, a previous project that James and I worked on, if you bricked a unit in the vehicle, you had to phone Bob from some other department, he had to come down, take out the seats, change all the wiring and replace the unit. And everyone's just stood around for a few hours. Your, your, days, your day of testing is down the, down the drain. And yeah, just a, a waste of time. And it's, it's these kind of hidden costs I think that it makes testing so important because it, it's very hard to kind of quantify that kind of thing, but, but it's always there. So, and, and conversely, if you improve your testing and you start finding more issues earlier, that's very hard to sort of, to measure because 
you're measuring something that never happened in a way. You know, you know that you're finding issues earlier, or you're not letting them in the software, but it's, yeah, it's kind of hard to, to justify. But so it's, it's these hidden costs we found. So yes, we want to catch them as early as possible. Um, also, we want to automate repetitive and manual tasks wherever possible. I'm certainly not saying that um, manual testing can completely be removed. It absolutely can't, it, it's, it's essential. But obviously, in, we, we want repeatable tests and manual testing by its definition can't really achieve proper repeatability. So um, the current project that I'm working on they have a, a full, uh, full system validation. It's a three-week test, and I think they do it every, every two months or so at the moment, uh, the tier one that I'm working with. And I asked the testing manager, how many times do you plug and unplug the USB media in order to test it? Does anyone want to guess? In a three-week full system validation test, how many times? Thousands, not bad. It was 800 which you know, I thought was fair play, it's quite a, a robust test, that's good. But uh, yeah, a huge amount of, of, of uh, tests. So um, if you were able to automate the USB media test, not only would you be able to not have somebody doing it during the day and you could make better use of the, the hardware resource because you could do it overnight, but that person would actually be free to do more important things, stress test the system, try and find edge cases, use it as a real user would, something much more interesting. Um, so it's not about removing manual testing or removing people who are manual testers, it's just about freeing them to do things that are more valuable and more interesting. And also maybe saving the sanity of this poor soul who had to do it. I think if we, we worked it out, I think, if, if you think it's 30 seconds per test, which is probably quite optimistic, because you have to check everything loads properly, it's uh, obviously 400 minutes, which is about a day. So a full day of someone's time doing that. Yeah, so uh, USB media was, um, was something we were, we were focused on, but it's, it's just a good specific example. Okay, I'll do a quick recap of some of the previous things that we've spoken about. So we spoke at uh, ELC 21 and FOSDEM 2022, and that talk was Lava and OpenQA was automated continuous system testing. So I'll talk a little bit about how we started, how we sort of identified OpenQA as a tool that we wanted to use, and how we combined that with Lava to get some testing on, on hardware. And as Walt said, we, we, I gave this talk at the uh, AGL AML, AMM in Berlin in March, but uh, we have some advancements since then as well. So the talk that we gave at FOSDEM and ELC, we sort of used this um, to mind the gap um, to sort of set the context here. So it wasn't specifically um, focused on automotive at the time, but I think the same principle does apply. So modern, testing modern software platforms is extremely time consuming, and there's generally a lot of manual testing. Um, and there's a lot of products, like I said at the beginning, where you might, you might use a kernel version that's supported for two years, but you know that your device is going to be in the field for 10 years or plus. So um, if you speak to upstreams, they will, you know, upstream projects will always say, use the latest version. And that's, that's absolutely right. You know, that's, that's, that's why they, they work on the latest versions. But in reality, we've found that there is this gap because the, the sheer amount of uh, regression testing that you need to do before you have the confidence to upgrade in, in many cases, you know, it, 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 isn't, it wasn't happening. And certainly, um, this wasn't a, a novel observation. There's a, a lot of people have, have had this observation before as well. I think there was a talk by Pengutronics from FOSDEM, I think, a few years back, which is very good on the same topic. So obviously, you know, upstream first, uh, that kind of thing is, is, is all going in the same direction. So we thought that basically more testing um, making testing more available is, is going to help maybe reduce that gap. So we looked at OpenQA. OpenQA is a very well-established testing framework. It's um, for the OpenSUSE project and maintained by OpenSUSE. So it's designed for Linux desktop environments, Linux distributions. Um, 
but we wanted to see if we could use this in um, an embedded context. It works on a principle of um, screenshot comparisons using these things called needles, and, and I'll talk about that in the next slide. Well, basically, it's a, a click and a cert and um, a timeout value and a screenshot, so you can compare what you, uh, what you expected to get in the UI versus what you did get. And what we really liked about it was that it's actually replicating how a user is using the software because it's a touch input. So it's not, you know, it's not sending loads of um, CAN messages from a uh, canalyzer as a simulation or something like that. It's, it's really is how the user would use the software. Um, and it's designed to work with QMU. So what's a needle and test in this context? So a needle is simply, it's the screenshot of what you expect to see. And then it's also some JSON coordinates. So you can do quite clever things like outline an area on the screenshot where you need to click, and then you can have an area that you want to mask. So for example, if the clock is changing in the corner, you don't want that to fail your test. So you can mask that area. And you can um, change the tolerance that you expect in different areas if you expect the colors to, in the background to be different, you know, shades of brightness and so forth. And then a test is uh, separate to that, and the test operates on the needle. So in the test, you can say where you want to click and how long you want to wait for. So with this system, you can, you can run multiple different tests on the same needle to navigate through to different areas and, and things like that. So you can relatively quickly, you can, you can get the workflow of the, all the different screens in the, in the UI. So brief overview of the architecture. Um, the tests themselves uh, are in Git, and that's quite useful because you can tag them with every release of the software. So obviously as your project matures, you're going to be adding more tests, so you can always keep track of, of where they were up to. Uh, and this, we, this is GitLab, because that's our weapon of choice, but it, it works with any other CI orchestration as well. Um, so that acts as a launcher, and it spins up an OpenQA worker. The OpenQA worker can be um, anything. We use GitLab runners, which is a VM, of course, where it can be a laptop or a Raspberry Pi. And then separately, you need an OpenQA server. And this does two things. It stores the needles, because they can get quite large, so you, you store them separately. Um, and then also, it has this kind of dashboard of results, which uh, I've, I've expanded on another slide as well. So um, yeah, and then uh, every time you want to do a test, the OpenQA worker will spin up an instance of QMU, and that's done ad hoc, so it's per test. And then it reports the results back to the OpenQA server. And a view would look like that. So you can see here just on the bottom, we've got a mainly green test run with one fail at the end. You could drill into that and see exactly you know, what, what you expected to see versus what you got. So um, that's OpenQA with uh, QMU as it's designed to work. We pushed this to the GNOME project. So GNOME OS is now using OpenQA in its uh, CI, which is very nice. Uh, there's a GNOME uh, OpenQA server. But, like I say, we wanted to get these exact same tests running on hardware. So we looked to Lava. And I think probably most people will have heard of Lava here. It uh, was originally a Linaro project. It's used a lot by the kernel CI projects as well. Essentially, um, you can, it, it, it's orchestration of hardware testing. So you can set up what's called a, uh, a board farm and have lots of different boards with different architectures on. And you flash your, uh, flash your image to it and then run your tests on it. So using VNC, we got that working with uh, OpenQA so that we could run the same test there instead of uh, QMU in emulation. And uh, yeah, we have a, a Lava instance at CodeThink now, and we have an OpenQA instance as well. And we are testing the Linux kernel upstream project every night with this. So we've got a, a Debian image that tests. And that's had some good feedback from Linux, which is great. So that's actually being used. Um, so yeah we managed to get the OpenQA tests working on a dev board. The next step after that was getting it onto representative hardware on, for example, an embedded project, an automotive project, and also getting something in place that allowed us to put it onto any generic hardware. And this led us to developing QAD and a host of other things. So I'm gonna hand over to James now, and uh, he'll take it from there. So, okay, what is QAD? Um, QAD is a uh, very, very lightweight Linux daemon um, 
that you can put onto pretty much any Linux system that uses DRM for rendering and EVDev for input. Um, so for example, this actually works on Android. You can run it on um, natively compiled it for Android Automotive. Um, and, and pretty much any type of system that uses DRM for rendering. Um, so this runs on real hardware. You can slot it in. The dependencies are incredibly minimal, so it's very easy to compile. You don't have to change anything about the software you're trying to test. Um, and that was a design goal. We, we did want to make this uh, in a way that didn't require a special test version of the software. We want to consume the version of the software from the CI that will end up in production and run the tests on that. So you build this statically linked binary and you put it on there. Um, and it's essentially creating this automatable test engineer. So what can it do? Um, QD is very simple. So we have um, a very, very simple HTTP API. So you run this daemon on your system, um, and it exposes two HTTP endpoints. So you can get HTTP get the screenshots of the display, uh, or multiple displays, and you can also post input events to it. So this is JSON formatted input data. So it's very, very simple. You specify the X, the Y, uh, duration, the type of event, uh, velocities, and things like that. So a byproduct of this, um, it was originally designed for testing, but because we now have access where you can get a screenshot and send an input event, you can actually use this as uh, a method to uh, remotely access the hardware that you want to test. So say you're working from home or um, you want to test something in a vehicle, this could be installed in the vehicle and then you can remotely connect to it and then control the UI. So if you want to test a new piece of software, you want to see if your changes have gone into effect, you can use this and then do that, um, depending on your network configuration, of course. Uh, what isn't QAD? Um, it's, it's very dumb, so it will not do anything by itself. You have to call uh, the screenshot, so you have to get that, and you have to post an input event. It doesn't provide any type of remote shell access, so keep on using SSH. Uh, it doesn't do any type of uh, test orchestration, so it will not do any automation for the tests at all. You need to use something else for that. Um, and it's not a silver bullet, so just because you have this doesn't mean your software is going to magically get better. So how do we actually automate QAD then? Um, as I said, we have a very, very simple get and post API, so we get the screenshot and we send input events. Um, so this ties in very nicely with the uh, the architecture of OpenQA and how you write OpenQA tests. Because OpenQA is based on this concept of asserting a screen and then clicking a point on there and making sure that worked. So for this, we've added a OpenQA console and backend into the QAD repository. Um, so you can actually integrate this with your OpenQA tests. So if you go back to this slide where we're using Lava for the hardware orchestration, um, this talks VNC to the Ubuntu instance that's running on the, uh, the target hardware there. So Lava has orchestrated this. Uh, it's provisioned the board. It's given you access to that. Boots, Ubuntu is running VNC, and then you use OpenQA. Um, and VNC is kind of the default protocol that OpenQA works, um, works with. But that's not what we want. So. We want to be able to run these tests on an automotive rig. So this is a big piece of hardware. It could be on a developer's desk. It could be a vehicle. Um, you know, it's got multiple ECUs, speakers, and all that type of thing. And we need some method of communicating with it that isn't going to introduce software that is going to change the parameters of the actual system. So I've never come across an automotive project that had a VNC server on, for example. So we can't use VNC. Um, and whenever people use Western, um, that does have a remote desktop protocol, but that usually is installed afterwards, so you're kind of making a test build in order to, to do that. So this is the architecture that we use for uh, the client um, that we're currently working with. Uh, so we have a GitLab instance, um, and then a developer will make a merge request into the Yocto recipes for the system, so they want to update the system. Uh, that merge request is then built, so we build the image. 
And then we send this to a GitLab runner. Now, the GitLab runner itself is a small, um, it, it's a small Intel machine, but it doesn't have to be that powerful. It could be a Raspberry Pi or something else, uh, something even more minimal. But this um, GitLab runner is essentially doing the orchestration for the test hardware. So this is physically attached to the automotive rack. So it will have uh, a CAN USB interface. It will have a serial interface to the rig. It will have Ethernet to the rig. And that um, particular device is running OpenQA Worker. And that's the thing that spawns the tests. So we download the image we just built from the CI pipeline onto that runner. Um, we then flash it onto the rig. So this is going to be rig dependent, of course. But we send it over and then run the uh, flashing procedure on that new image. We reboot, and then we start QAD. So once we've started QAD, we can now run our OpenQA tests. Um, using the QAD console that we've developed for OpenQA. Um, one of the real benefits of actually using OpenQA for this type of thing is if you're a developer, as part in the CI pipeline during the testing stage, uh, you can get instant feedback. So you get a link to the test reports that Lauren showed earlier, but this will also give you a live view of the testing. So as the tests are running, you can see um, the tests running on hardware in real time. Um, so you do get this instantaneous feedback there. Um, and then, of course, once it's finished, you can pass or fail the pipeline, uh, depending on the policies there. Uh, you know, some tests are not as important as others, but perhaps if CarPlay didn't start, you would want to fail that pipeline. Uh, and here's a video. So this is a, a demo of this. So the rig in question here, this is actually um, it's the AGL demo platform. Uh, it's running on a Raspberry Pi and there's a multi-touch uh, touchscreen attached. So I think we'll go to the terminal in a minute. So on the right-hand side there, this is the OpenQA worker being um, run on a piece of hardware. On the right-hand side now, they're launching QAD on the device. On the left-hand side is EV test, just to show you that the input events are coming through. So now they start the tests, and this is the type of thing that would be done by the CI, so the CI would start the test. And you can see there, we've got a test that goes from the home screen to the HVAC. Um, and you can see the input events arriving. Now we have another test that goes back to the home screen, and you can see the input events there. Uh, now that test is finished, that's the only test we did for that, so it's a very, very simple demo. So it's finished. You can now go to the OpenQA um, server and see the results of that. Now, this is actually one of my favorite things about OpenQA. The UI for this is exceptional for reviewing tests. So you can, there's a slider to compare screenshots if something fails. Um, there's a needle editor, so if you need to update the needles, if you need to update the screenshot because something's changed in the UI, you can use that. Um, so it makes it very, very easy to kind of update these tests. Now, as I said, there is a needle editor in the web UI, so if you need to update a test and you need to update the JSON in the test, then uh, use that. It's very, very simple, and it will push it to Git, and then you can start using that test straight away. Um, but what we found when trying to retrofit this approach onto an existing platform that had no testing uh, was creating those needles in the first instance was a bit of a chore. So we, we've got dozens of tests here, and we have to create the needle and the JSON file for them um, in the first instance. And it, it wasn't that easy. Uh, which is why we invented um, this QAD web UI. So this actually is useful without writing tests, because you can actually use this to remotely access your uh, hardware here. So you can connect to um, QAD running on a piece of hardware and use this to then uh, navigate through uh, the UI and what have you. Um, but its main purpose is actually to create those JSON uh, files and take the screenshot for a particular needle. So you can uh, specify your needle directory, you can give it the project directory, you can edit existing needles from there. Um, you can easily, there's a WYSIWYG editor, so you can define the uh, areas that you want to mask and the areas that you're interested in, because at the threshold, and then you can export all of that to the uh, PNG JSON pairing there. Um, now, you don't have to use this. This is, uh, I don't think it's actually currently open source, but we're 
about to press the button on that. Um, but it, it, I think it's very useful, and it's very useful as this remote access technology. So whenever there's a failure on a piece of hardware that is running in a different country, we, we use this to see what's happening. So the future work for QAD, um, it's, it's a new project, so it's not the most mature thing in the world. Uh, it does work. Um, we need to open source the web UI, uh, and we probably need to do more screen capture backends. So um, the default one that we use now is a DRM backend, so it literally just grabs the uh, rendered frame buffer from the DRM subsystem. We do have uh, a Western backend, but that's a Western backend specifically for the Geneva layer manager. So this is the uh, ILM protocol. Uh, and that, that, that is useful because you can then speak ILM to anything that's um, uh, using layer manager on a system. So you can ask for the screen and um, configure it that way. Um, more input devices. So in terms of the input device, uh, we either piggyback on an existing piece of hardware that's on there, so let's say the multi-touch monitor, or we do have a U-input backend, so you can create these virtual um, touchscreen, keyboard, and mouse devices. Um, if for some bizarre reason your Linux system is not using EVDev for the input, you would have to create that yourself. Um, but it's, it's relatively trivial. You just have to implement the primitives uh, in the input. Uh, it's MIT licensed, and if you scan that QR code, that's the repository for it. So this gets us to a very good place. So now we have a lot of tests where uh, we can exercise the UI, we can uh, see what's going wrong, we can verify that the, the, the system looks good. But of course, an automotive project is, is a lot more than just touching a screen and seeing what the reaction is. Um, now, we need to automate things like the CAN interactions. So if I went to the climate application and I increased the temperature, that will send a CAN message which we then need to respond to. So if we did want to have a test that did that to check that the temperature was increased, we also need to provide that CAN simulation. And we want to do this without relying on a Windows laptop running CANalyzer. Uh, you know, we want to put this on the control device. So this is a, an example I just came up with uh, before the talk. Um, so we have a very, very simple JSON parsing CAN um, uh, daemon that runs on the control unit and it's connected using a USB CAN device. And we can just simply define uh, the types of signals that we want to send, the period, whether or not we want to send them at the start, and we can map them to um, signals that we receive. So for the example of the uh, HVAC unit there, we will get a fan uh, event received in a particular uh, format. We then need to send that back um, with the temperature or the fan speed. Um, and we can do that quite easily with uh, a, a simple JSON signal map there. Uh, it, that definitely needs more work. Um, and that's not open at the moment, but this is something we are thinking about. Now, another piece of hardware that we developed for this project um, is this USB switcher. So the example Lawrence gave of inserting a USB stick, taking the USB stick out 800 times, uh, can now be automated using this piece of hardware. Um, this this act actually has been brilliant for the testing because now we can actually test for every merge request USB media. Uh, does, it, does it come up? Is the sort order correct? Is, um, does it play? Uh, if we remove it, does it go away? If we put it back in, does it come back? Um, if we change the language, is the sort order in Chinese correct? Is the sort order in Korean correct? Um, and all those types of things are, are, are open using this piece of hardware. Um, again, this is attached to the control unit that's attached to the rig. Um, and then you can put two USB devices in and switch them using a very, very simple uh, serial API there. Um, and another amazing thing is that we can now test CarPlay as well. So um, we can have a test where we plug an iPhone in. Uh, does it come up? Does it come up in two seconds? Does the functionality within the CarPlay application actually work? So here's a bit more about the switch. Um, it has, so it, you can connect two devices to one host. So that's two, uh, a USB stick and an iPhone, for example. 
to one rig. If you did want to connect, connect more, so if you wanted a, an Android device, an iPhone, and a USB stick, you can daisy chain these and use it that way. So you can switch them on and off. Um, so you can have as many uh, devices plugged in as you, you want. Um, that's completely open, so uh, it's open source hardware, the firmware, everything about it is open source. Um, and it's, it's generically useful, so it's, it's not just for automotive testing. If, if you need to automate any type of USB procedure, this type of thing is, a, is an absolute godsend. Uh, so the QR code there will link you to the uh, GitLab uh, repository for all of that. Now all of that brings us to something that CodeThink has been working on for the last um, couple of months, and that is testing in a box. So everything that was just described there in the process kind of looks like that. Um, you can see on the left, there's a control unit, which is the GitLab runner and the OpenQA worker. There's an iPhone attached, a USB switch, um, Ethernet dongles. There's a, a CAN um, device there, peak CAN USB device. And, and it's, it's a lot. Um, and it's not that easy to put into a rack or uh, to stack up anywhere. And it's certainly not the type of thing you would want to take into a vehicle for testing, because it's just a bit of a mess. And all of that requires setup. So uh, you need to set up the control unit. You need to install the software. You need to um, find, provision all of these CAN devices. You need to uh, buy the hardware. You need to plug it in. Um, and that's not ideal, and that takes time. So the solution is to literally put all of that into one box. And it does exist. Here's, here's, a, here's the very first one, I believe. Um, and so what this does is it allows you to connect to a piece of hardware that you want to test. And it has a number of interfaces. So it has a serial uh, I.O. interface. It has CAN bus emulation. Um, the USB switch that was previously mentioned is built into that. It has a USB hub. Um, it has a Bluetooth and Wi-Fi um, chip. I think it's a RISC-V uh, chip in there. Um, and that actually is quite exciting because now we can do tests where we mock a phone, for example. So in our current test rig, we actually have um, a Google Pixel that's close to the test hardware so we can then test whether or not contacts download or whether or not it's paired correctly or whether or not the music's available. Um, but with this, we could then mock that. We could send contacts. We could change the name, we could unpair, we could repair, we can do all that in an automatable way, uh, which isn't that easy because you know, you'd have to do that on the Android side. Um, has I swear C, SPI, um, HID emulation, so you can use this as a keyboard and mouse for a device, so if you uh, wanted to automate sending keyboard presses or mouse movements, uh, you can use it for that. And it also has a host PC in. Uh, I can't remember what the actual host PC in there, but it's, it's some lightweight um, ARM board. And that allows you to also then put the software directly into the box. So you can install the GitLab runner. You can install, uh, actually run an instance of GitLab CI in there. Uh, and it has all of the software, QAD, OpenQA, ready to go and ready to deploy. Um, you know, this, this, is, this is really going to be very useful because you can take this onto any project, plug it in, and then start writing these tests almost immediately. Um, and the provisioning for, for this, it's, um, it's all in Ansible. So you can deploy to this using Ansible. Um, it contains all of the software. We're planning to add CI templates so you can more easily integrate this type of thing into your um, existing CI, so you know, we prefer GitLab, but you could, be, you could use this on anything. Uh, and we're working on a version two of the board, so there's gonna be more features. Um, now this is also gonna include software, um, again, that we're open sourcing to monitor performance of tests, so we can gather data about a test run and then compare it with a previous one. So let's say you have a merge request um, that comes in, you can do the test, get that performance data, and compare it against the one that's in the current master branch. So you can easily spot things like the CPU usage has gone through the roof, or memory consumption's uh, uh, high, um, and things like that. And that's all going to be part of this testing in a box. Um, so the QR code there links to that group. 
Um, so it's quite exciting, and if anyone wants to take a look at it afterwards, then uh, feel free. I think it works. I've not actually plugged it in. Um, but yes, that's uh, yes, that's it for me. Thank you. Thanks, James. So, yep, yeah, just to recap, um, we started off talking about testing is expensive and it has hidden costs. Automating testing, um, functional testing in this way presented us with quite a lot of challenges. We found it quite hard, but with the right tooling, it can be easier. And um, obviously all the tooling is open source. So uh, I think at the end as well, that the, the great thing with testing in a box, which is why we really wanted to do it, with OpenQA and all of the other tooling, obviously I've said before we were on this journey to sort of figuring out as we were going. <clears throat> um, but yeah, everything was ready to go, so it, it, that would have saved us months, really. Setting up OpenQA is a pain, so that would have saved us a lot of time. Okay, and we are out of time, so that's the end of the talk. Are there any questions? Is no any time for questions? No, oh, no. sorry. I thought we had 50 minutes. Okay. Well, we're, we're here, so you can always ask us, please feel free to ask us any questions. All right.